All right, we're live. I'm going to see how this works. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Verdi Robusto. Uh, this is Schumann Residence Harmonics channel on YouTube and Facebook and uh, points in between at Patreon. Please support me on Patreon. I'm also on WordPress. Uh, I have a web uh, website, um, which I need to, you know, support them and give them money, you know. Um, I'm also on PayPal. Uh, I'm on Venmo, Venmo, which I invest in uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, it's easier to do that than pull out whatever money. Um, anyway, um, so if you're new here, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if it's not too much difficulty, please hit the notification bell next to the subscribe. Uh, and that helps you. It helps me, um, but it helps you also get notifications. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't necessarily care about the subscriber part and all of that, the analytics, but uh, you really, you know, need to ha as much help as you can to get the, uh, uh, the notifications properly. Uh, trust me on that. Um, so hit the, the bell and comment early and often. Uh, I just did a premiere today, earlier. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, probably not tonight making this as a premiere because it's like 11 uh, and it's, you know, I don't want to be up too late tonight because um, uh, it's 11. It's a full moon. And so that's why I'm doing this. You know, it's Mercury retrograde. Uh, and so, you know, as I write in the description here, you know, I think this is a good time. Mercury retrogrades, you know, this one's special, but regardless of which particular one, um, I would maintain to you that uh, the the retrograde period of you know of any any of the the rulers any of the you know the signets the planets is a time to reflect. But in the case of the Mercury, uh, no new contracts. Right? Don't start any new agendas, new contracts, new ventures. Right? Don't get any electronics generally. Uh, you know, and there are some general rules to, you know, all the Mercury retrogrades. And this one, you know, the other people have done these videos, and I'm not the one to really truly talk about what they mean on the astrological level. Uh, Queen V, Lady V um, did one that explains this, right? And you can, maybe I'll put the link in the thing, because I really like her. I appreciate her. I respect her. She does good work, you know, and she's the one that I go to on, I'm just honest, you know, about the astrology and stuff. And so she may have, you know, poo pooed me on the Schumann Resonances thing, but I still have a lot of respect for her. And because, you know, I, I feel she's led and she, you know, regardless of whatever, you know, thing about the comment and the Schumann Resonances, I still have a lot of respect for her because she does good work and I think she's touched and blessed, you know. And that's why I respect her and call her Queen V. You know, she's earned that, Empress, I guess, you know. Like, I've earned my kingship, you know, my crown is open, you know, I've earned my, you know, emperorship, you know, colonel-ness. Uh, I don't use the title, you know, but it's it's there um, for my service, you know. Same thing with her, you know, dedicated service that's, you know, you earn your stripes, right? All right, so <clears throat> I guess that's as as an introduction, you know, and I just it's important to, to to just remember here on Earth and free will, the free will zone, you know, you get what you what you earn, you know, it's you know as you work, you you know you the fruits of your labor, you know, a person is known, the crew, the worker is known through the fruits of his or her labor. It's just that simple, right? What kind of uh, I have a candle going, a scented candle. You know, what kind of message are they saying and sending out? And what are they doing and bringing forth in their own life? Right? I, that, I think that's a fair way to put that, right? And this kind of falls into, gently falls into our topic of game, you know, game theory. Uh, and I describe game just as one of the principles of um, linear time and space and just the first primary principle of, you know, one of the primary principles down here, organizing principles is game, interchange, right? Uh, cause and effect, you know, but on a personal, personality level, right? Uh, I, I think that's what should be understood about this, that it's not just 
like a biological, mechanical, you know, uh, scientific principle or whatever of cause and effect, sure, but it's act and reaction, right? Acting and reaction, play and playing, uh, um, you know, um, and in our case here, it's not just cause and effect, but it's cause with the effect to win, right? And that's where we're at, that it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's a, uh, like goal oriented, highly intelligent, right? I think organized, right? Uh, organization implies intelligence, I believe. I think that's one of the qualities of it intelligence. How well does it want to stay alive? <laughs> uh, how does it know it is alive? You know, are you conscious? How do you know? Right? That's one of the ways. Um, so, uh, not to get too far afield, All right? Um, but uh, um, I'm asking my guides right now to be present with us uh, for the message to be opened that would we they would have for me for us for you here in this time that um, uh, is relevant for. The message and the mission at hand. Um, so I lost track. I'm six minutes into it. I've done my proper introduction. Um, the uh, basically the the material of the book. I and I'll just give a quick introduction to how I became introduced to this was my friend CJ when I think we were eight like. 2021 20, maybe around that time 18 19 20 something around there uh and um we uh he gave this to me his sister gave it to him it's very uh, uh you, you'll see uh in a little bit um it it takes a bit to kind of mentally process it right and so before i get into the actual material uh, I wanted to do an introduction. You know, he's got a website, Cars, uh, uh, the author, has a website, you know, and explains, introduces it. And I thought, oh, this is a great way to introduce it because the book itself just goes right into the text. And it's like, oh, my, there's not even like a forward. So it's like, okay. Um, so I thought I'd give a quick forward of a sort from the author because, I, you know, it does. he speaks a good does a good job speaking for himself okay um and it uh it was informative to me like oh okay so um this is one of the memories of my you know friend and brother cj who passed away uh like two years ago i think now uh or it will be this year in september uh it was a year last year you know like uh i'm, I'm like i'm pretty sure yeah uh, time flies, you know, there's the, the COVID year that flew by that, you know, everything was, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that, that was a year in there too, you know, the year that was hidden, uh, oddly hidden, um, uh, and so, um, you know, he, um, uh, we talked, talked a little bit about this, this was one of those instrumental books, and so, you know, you, you know, as you, you start reading this and saying this, uh, You'll see why it's, you know, was eye-opening, and I'm pretty sure it'll be eye-opening to you as well. Uh, and, you know, I do research, right? Um, and so this is a different type of research, as you'll see, that I thought was absolutely fascinating, okay? Um, and uh, uh, I, um, uh, I'm almost at 10 minutes. Um, you know, uh, uh, let me just pause this. Actually, this is good point you know why don't you uh if you need to take a drink smoke break pause this here then let's sing a little bit okay so um i'll just send a shout out to, uh and some love to jacqueline and pamela uh who are doing well at least uh pamela's doing a full moon ritual and whatever uh um i think that's you know fair enough to make public um and uh you know uh I just much love to them. They support me, you know, uh, you know, comments and all that. Um, as does Bradley. Uh, 
you know and so you know there's others that i kind of work with and uh we talk information you know and i'm very helpful in a technical kind of respect and so i'm grateful for people that um you know that i'm able to you know kind of do my job higher order stuff that there are people who are advanced let's put it that way um and uh, i'm grateful for that because it, it really makes me feel like i'm doing something you know it's one thing to help a beginner and it's like they're very grateful it's nice and i, and I like that that's wonderful but it's like you know i'd like to work with the adults at some point point you know like you know you can't help so you know working with kids all the time is fine it's nice it's great it's groovy i love it yeah yeah thanks i appreciate it i love it i'm grateful it's wonderful yeah they're great they're awesome you know yay you know it's like a kindergarten kid teacher you know i work with you know the beginners all day it's like you know i would like to talk with some the adults that the you know the um the advanced ones you know i may not be able to help exactly everything the you know exactly what they were looking for but there are other things that i've said and done that were helpful in their own way that were in a different way that opened things up and you know just go oh, wow you know I'm, I'm the tech person i know you know higher order kind of stuff the astral etheric technician i've described myself as an etheric te technician and you know if you see my stuff you understand you know all right, so um, I think CJ, um, uh, uh, this is uh, my introduction to this. So I've read through um, a number of chapters. Uh, I'm not going through too far because there's, I don't, uh, I, 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 it's hard to determine what's relevant, but I know that the further on we go, it's going to seem a lot more abstract. And so I think it'll become obvious where it's not quite relevant. Okay. But this is probably going to be a relatively long, and this is going to be a couple hours anyway, because the, you know, I want to introduce this and the, I don't know how many it's sold, but you know, it's, uh, uh, oh my God, you know, let me just say people have commented. I, I get a lot of comments holy crap you read a lot you know you know you're you're well read you you where do you come up with this stuff how do you you know i i research i i read i read i'm a reader i i joke with people here may this may be my joke that i i of the video that i'm a really good book starter i'm just not really a great book ender you know like i can tell you a lot of great book starting remark marks or starting uh you know beginning phrases of a lot of books I, I you know maybe more than the average person you know these days certainly uh as all my old you know everyone kind of goes to the wayside i'm the last one left standing in my class and yeah so maybe in, of my class but they're all gone you know uh so uh you know I could should go down a list of the great books that I know the starting of, you know. Um uh but anyway, you know. So uh book endings uh, I I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I don't think I could tell you one good book ending <laughs> quite honestly. As I think about it, you know, like I, I'm pretty sure I know, you know. Um just, you know, for the record a little bit that's just a little bit about me being, you know, who I am. You know, I um I, I have some college. I've gone to college. I have an associate's degree plus, you know, um, and the technical training, a lot of technical training. So I have my master's equivalent with, you know, practical, hands on, you know, stuff. And in fact on the Schumann resonance, I it's especially it's specialty on the Schumann resonances. So theoretically I could I'm at a doctorate's level of all the, you know, the work I put in, uh, and all the stuff I've written, my thesis, you know, the shit ton, the metric shit ton of, of uh, writing I've I've done, um, you know. So uh, I learned that a gross ton relative to scrap, you know, working with my boss, my nighttime boss uh, from the bar, a gross ton is you know at the scrap if you go into the scrap it is gt well gross ton is two thousand two hundred and uh forty eight pounds 
So they cheat you out of like 248 pounds, right? A ton is, you know, it should be a net ton, I guess they call that, uh, is um, 2,000 pounds is a net ton, you know, um, uh, and the gross ton is different. You know, they cheat you, the gross, you know, the scrap, just in case you don't know, just so you know, right? The measurement of a scrap ton is different than, you know, the weight of a vehicle ton, right? At the weigh station, they give you a proper, you know, it's a net ton. It's not a gross ton, right? You see on the side of the vehicle, right? You'll have the gross vehicle weight, and then they tear that, T-A-R-E, and then you have the net weight of it, but it's at a, the standard ton and not the gross ton, right? Just for what it's worth. <laughs> Easy to know, right? Um... Uh, and knowing is half the battle. All right. So, um, all right. So on that cheery note, um, I should probably get into the material. Um, maybe I'll play some music. I don't know. I have something queued up. Um, Aramix queued up. Uh, um, and, uh, so I'm going to, um, I think just show you real quick. Uh, you know, this is from Google, uh, books, basically, right? So there is, uh, Carse's Mr. Carse's website, okay, um, but then there's the Google Books, okay. So, <clears throat> Carse, uh, you know, I I'm thinking he probably wants you to buy the book because it is on sale, and um, we're gonna do a, a Google Books preview, all right. So uh, I thought that you know, like you know, this is the this is the this is my sit down job, you know. I have actually this is three give it you know three or four whatever you know uh if you consider the videos one and then you know everything i post on patreon that goes with it you know like all right it's my platform so this is my third job really and the landscaping job which is puts the roof of my head and then i have the night uh job of the boss uh at the bar doing you know helping him with the building and stuff uh and then there's here the studio i mean the studio uh doing all of the you know the 30, 40 hours a week doing this, you know, 20 hours, whatever it is, um, you know, for, for you guys, uh, um, you know, because this, you definitely, you know, this, this, you need to know this, right? I introduced it. I talked about it and there are some really important kind of rules in here of what's happening that you really, you know, my guide said they, they really should, this is a well thought out book. Okay. So this is, um, you know, see vision of life as play and possibility. This is the title of the same, you know, cover that I saw when I was introduced to the book. All right. So what I'm going to do before I go into the material, um, let me just say, this is on, you know, Google books. Uh, it was published October 11th, 2011. No, that, oh, that ebook, the ebook was published 2011. This one was from, yeah, 1986, uh, English. And it's listed under philosophy, general philosophy, metaphysics, well, yeah, social games, sim, symbolic aspects. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All right. So, uh, he, he doesn't really, Karst doesn't really say this on his website, but I'll just read you his biography. James P. Karst is, all right, James P. Karst is Professor Emeritus of History and Literature of Religion at New York University, a winner of the university's Great Teacher Award. Oh, I like him already. He is author of The Religious Case Against Belief, 2008, and Breakfast at the Victory, the Mysticism of Ordinary Experience, 1994. Oh, that sounds profound. Karst lives in New York, in New York City in Massachusetts. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Um, so and these are his other books and stuff. And, you know, they got reviews. One. <sighs> this guy gives him one star and this guy gives him five stars. Jason Cumley. Well, this book didn't ex affect my perception of reality, but I hoped... It might, but Karst executed nicely on what I think is a brilliant concept. All right, he gave the guy five stars. All right, so I, I give him five. I did not. I probably should. Uh, uh, I don't see where... 
I don't think I can review that without signing in. All right. So, um, although I, I looks like I'm signed in. All right. Well, all right. But anyway, I'm not going to review that right now. Um, uh, so it, it talks about this. Uh, there are at least two types of games, states James P. Cars, as he begins his extraordinary book, right? Good beginnings, right? One might be called finite, the other infinite. The finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. All right. So we are... Um, all right. So let me go to his website. All right. Um, and I think I'm at the 20-minute mark. I think I'm going to play some music. And I'll just leave this up for you to walk at.
really bad. I literally I forgot I have this playing. I'm actually texting someone, uh, and um, so uh, I can't keep letting this play. I'm gonna pause this for a little bit here um, and pause it. So it's not, this is a great point to you know have a smoke break or whatever. Um, I get to pause this and actually take care of my texts um, with a person who's doing a ritual uh, right now. So I'm um, just going to pause this, have a smoke. Um, I'm going to have a smoke, and then I'm going to come back and try and, you know, scale Mount Finite and in Infinite Games. <laughs> Mount, Mount Cars, <laughs> if I can. So, oh, it's at 30 minutes. is perfect, right? Okay, we're back. All right. Um, okay, yeah, I'm back. I played music, a <laughs> bunch of music, I'm chatting. Oh, man, I don't know about you, I got a lot going on here in the studio. Uh, this is, and I love being a DJ, VJ, uh, YouTube content guy with platform, something to say, you know, like, this is definitely legitimately my third job here, you know? Yeah, people say, oh, you know, like, I, yeah, I have a purpose, you know, I have a meaning, I work a lot, uh, you know, um... I I don't know if I'm, you know, patting myself on the back or just, you know, just coming to the terms with I'm busy as fuck. And then there's the bikes, you know, I just work on my bike, you know, and I haven't painted a bike in a while uh, or sold a bike or traded it or whatever. Um, all right, I'm working upward, right? We're, we're, we're here for this, this purpose. All right. So, um, you know, before uh, we go on. Um, let me just, we're going to just channel for a minute, you know, just, or collect our thoughts, uh, you know, and get ourselves around while we're here, you know, um, so we ask our guides to be here present with us. And so we learn what we need to, and the message is clear to us, you know, all, of us. all right. So, um, all right. So this is, uh, James P. Cart, or this is jamescars.com, right? So these are his own words, all right? In the early 80s, NYU professor William Zartman gathered about a dozen faculty from as many departments to discuss game theory, uh, each from the perspective of our own academic field. Zartman was, a, was in political science. Math and the sciences were well represented, as were the social sciences. I was to be the philosopher. Game theory, it became clear at once, is a maddeningly subtle subject, especially in its mathematical and scientific expressions. Okay. You might not have thought of game, game theory, represent, uh, uh, relevant to mathematic or scientific expressions, but oh, there it is. All right, so I'll, let's see how deep this rabbit hole goes. As the weekly discussions and the presented papers made clear, game theory had chiefly to do with winning conflicts or minimizing losses where winning was impossible. Without advanced mathematical skills, I found myself reflecting on the nature of play itself especially play that saw no value in winning or even play that actively avoided winning, right? There's an interesting thought for you. Who actively avoided winning, right? That's interesting, okay. Okay, um, the result, uh, keep that in mind, actively avoided winning. The result was a 150 page book, well, sorry, uh, initially published in 1986, by the free press, still in print and published in a dozen or more languages, the entire first chapter read, quote, there are at least two kinds of games. One could be called finite and the other infinite. The finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. Although it might be obvious, it is worth stressing that play, as it is used here, does not mean playing around. Play in this discussion is a metaphor for any number of complex human engagements 
whenever they take on a competitive or cooperative character. Corporations, for example, not only compete with each other, but are in themselves population subscribers, each trying to supplant another, each struggling for higher incomes and titles. The same applies to schools and colleges where attaining superior grade averages, degrees, and honors absorb the lives of students. Sexuality and marriage are often finite battlegrounds with winners and losers. In fact, the features of play, finite and infinite, are essentially the same whether we are children playing games or soldiers caught up in a war between nations. Okay. Oh, please. Never a dull moment here. You know, I do these on the spot and I, you know, they're, I, you know, right in the middle of it, I adjust the, uh, what it looks like. Uh, sexuality and marriage are often, you know, close up. Right? Let's get close up to our reading so I can actually read it over here. Uh, sexuality and marriage are often finite battlegrounds with winners and losers. In fact, the features of play, finite and infinite, are essentially the same whether we are children playing jacks or soldiers caught up in a war between nations. Oh, okay, so that's interesting. And we'll be getting into more of this in a little bit, all right? Okay, all right, I think that's better. All right, so where was I? Um, sexuality and marriage are often finite battlegrounds. Where, where am I? Hello. Sexuality and marriage are often finite battlegrounds with winners and losers. In fact, right, isn't that the case, right? In fact, the features of play, finite and infinite, are essentially the same whether we are children playing jacks or soldiers caught up in a war between nations or a fella on his bike. You know, like it, there's play and interchange, right? All right, so, and continuing the play, continuing the course of the play. I think that's really important to understand what is the play, what's your game, right? We ask each other that, you know, what's your angle, what's your game, right? I think that's a, you know, it's a well-known, under, understood thing, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, uh, in the same sense that everyone, I believe, the majority of people, understand the kind of, uh, you know, the phrase, the vibe, vibrations, you know, your vibrations, raising vibes. I think, it, you know, it's hard to tell what everyone knows. I can't speak for everyone, but the majority of people that I can think of are, you know, just tend to think that way. It's a very common thing, right? If it's not you, that's fine. You can leave the comments. You can call me whatever names you want in the comments. That's fine. Okay, so this is not a sponsor, but I would like you to know this is like the greatest ginger beer in the world. It's the, uh, their name is, you know, it's Jamaican style ginger beer, not DC brand or G DG, and it's absolutely fabulous. And their thing is, oh, it's peppery. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is really good. Next to brewing my own, it's really, it's really, really good. <clears throat> I get ginger ale, but that's, you got to go to the, um, the multi, cultural section you know the goya same section has the goya and the rice and all that good other good stuff the saison i get that i get all that stuff uh oh i get i get from all the other uh you know hussein sauce chinese you know the uh the soy sauce uh the fish sauce all that my mom cooked with all that so she you know i'm familiar with you know a lot of that and uh it's good stuff you know um anyway not to get off topic um so, uh, you know, so it's interesting to know, you know, and as I put my own, you know, experience into this, you know, guy on a bike, you know, the uh, game theory plays in there. All right. So as this rather simple idea developed, uh, there were unexpected fe uh, features of play, especially competitive or finite play that came into sudden view. Uh, if the purpose of a finite game is to conclude play as a winner, then play itself acquires distinctly negative quality. Since your opponents seek only to make you a loser, the play actually stands in the way of their desired result. Winning ends the game at once. Finite players find themselves in a strange situation. They're playing against play itself. Okay, some interesting things to think about, all right. 
Oh, oh, okay. That is properly brilliant. All right. So, onward and upward. You know, like a close-up. You know, it's it's an action movie, right? This is this is me in the classroom, how I would be in the classroom. Uh, this contradiction has a number of consequences. For one, a combatant will appraise the strengths and weakness of the opponent so as to so as to have a faultless strategy if this is done perfectly there is basically no game at all merely the appearance of one the combatant has become what i call in the text a master player a true master player completes a game only for the theater of it the outcome was determined in advance Master players are rare, of course, but it is some, somewhere right, somewhere in the fantasy of every serious competitor to be one. We saw in the previous century, um, I'm not even going to follow this. We saw in the previous century how a self-identified master race collectively believed they had won the contest for superiority over all other races before, even before the contest began. They were winners at birth. History stopped with them. It also stopped them. The, a second insight yielded by the simple distinction, sorry, is that finite play itself has any number of desirable values. A group of friends meets every Thursday at a club to play poker. They have been doing it for years and almost never does one of them miss the occasion. The rules are precise and never broken. The competition is fierce. Each one of them obsesses over being the master player among the four of them. Suddenly the playing is over and they leave for home delighted to have had such a lively evening with friends. To use the language of the book, they were playing a finite game, poker, within the infinite game, lifelong relationship or lifelong friendship. A finite game begins to have ugly consequences when it is played, played within another finite game. Let's say some of our poker players have truly decided they cannot continue living unless they emerge victors every time. That is, master players. That's their game. Poker is only part of it. How often it happens is open hostility emerges, friendships turn to hatred, alcohol is involved, then fists, occasionally guns. Okay. The question gets very complicated. Did president did president uh, sorry, I can't even say this. Did President Putin bomb Syrian civ civilians out of a long friendship with Assad, or was it a move to be the master player over his corner of the world? What was the longer game in the American invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan? What, for what, for instance, is meant by the term American exceptionalism? Are Americans born with history on their side? One, or I'm sorry, our simple distinction now makes us look directly at the nature of an infinite game. If the purpose of such human engagement with the world is to continue the play, it would mean that there are no winners and no losers. The essential strategy would be to keep everyone in play. Finite players play within strict rules, else they cannot say who has won or who has lost. Infinite players play with rules because they must be constantly adjusting in response to changing circumstances. Master players do what they can to prevent surprise. Infinite players expect to be surprised. History did not end with their birth, neither with, will it end with their dying. The future is open and unpredictable. This is why the play of an infinite player is not a play but true. It is not a scripted repetition of the past, but the creative labor of imagining an open future, a future that stays open. Okay. As noted, the distinction between these two kinds of games has wide application. As an example, I will excerpt 
a discussion of our intended mastery over nature by way of machinery that is technology. And for those of you who are around, who you know, who are familiar with this, when we talk about technology, the ruling force of of this age coming in really is Araman. Uh, it's important to understand that. Uh, to expose a contradictory feature of finite play. The text will be slightly redacted. I will leave out the allegiance. Chapter 84, and I assure you I did not make it to chap chapter 84, trust me. We make use of machines to increase our control over natural phenomena. By nothing more than fingertip controls, a team of workers can cut a six-lane highway through mountains or fill in wetlands to build shopping malls. In other words, it doesn't take much. While a machine greatly aids the operator in such tasks, it also disciplines its operator. As the machine might be considered the extended arms and legs of the worker, the worker might be considered an extension of the machine. All right. And so we also look at the machine from the perspective of the spectrogram, the Schumann resonance data, right? Becoming held prisoner to that, to a mindset behind it. To operate a machine, one must operate like a machine. Using a machine to do what we cannot do, we find we must do what the machine does. All right, this is really complex. This is why I never, I didn't make it to, you know, chapter 26 uh, or whatever, 84, uh, sorry. Um, but what it's saying is that, you know, this is how we're, we are interacting with the machine is it's not just, oh, we're, you know, in charge of it. It's like, oh yeah, there's a trade-off, right? So it's a trade-off. Uh, we make ourselves into machinery uh, in order to operate them. You're held prisoner to the machine. Right? Machinery does not steal our spontaneity from us. We set it aside ourselves to deny our originality. Because we make use of machinery in the belief we can increase the range of our freedom, but in fact only decrease it, we use machinery against ourselves. Right? Chapter 25, uh, chapter 85, sorry. There we go. Machinery itself is contradictory in another way. Just as we use machinery against ourselves, we use machinery against itself. A machine is not a way of doing something. It stands in the way of doing something. The goal of technology is to eliminate itself, to become silent, invisible, forgotten. We do not purchase an automobile, for example, merely to own some machinery. Indeed, it is not machinery we're buying at all, but what we can have by way of it, right? The freedom that a machine, my van, offers, for example. Uh, a means of rapidly carrying us from one location to another, an object of envy for others, in many cases, right? Uh, protection from the weather, similarly, a radio must cease to exist as equipment and become sound. A perfect radio will draw no attention to itself, will make it seem we are in the very presence of the source of its sounds, right? So the good studio will never let you know it's there, right? It just it wants to it it wants to be as transparent as it can to the original source. Neither do we watch a movie screen nor look at television. We look at what is on the television or in the movie, and become annoyed when the equipment intrudes, when the film is unfocused, or the speakers hiss. Well, that is those of you who are not technicians, those of us who are, are fascinated by that, because ultimately we're looking to, you know, solve the problem that's wrong. <laughs> when machinery functions perfectly, it ceases to be there, but so do we. Radios and film allow us to be where we are not, and not be where we are. We persuade ourselves that, comfortably seated behind the wheels of our autos, shielded from every unpleasant change of weather, and raising or lowering our foot an inch or two, we have actually traveled somewhere while never leaving home. We do not go somewhere in a car, but arrive somewhere in a car. Automobiles do not make travel possible, 
will make it possible for us to move locations without traveling. When it is most effective, machinery will have no effect at all. Chapter 86. Since we use machinery against itself and against ourselves, we also machine <clears throat> we also use machinery against each other. I cannot use machinery without using another. I do not talk on the telephone. I talk with someone on the telephone. I listen to someone on the radio, drive to visit a friend, compute business transactions. If your business activities cannot translate into data recognizable by, by my computer, I have no business with you. If to operate a machine is to operate like a machine, then we not only operate with each other like machines, we operate each other like machines. If, and if, sorry, and if a machine is most effective when it has no effect, then we operate each other in such a way that we reach the outcome desired in such a way that nothing happens. <laughs> oh, there's, you know, I'm, I, I need to get to the beginning of this, you know, uh, this is all the, the, you know, this is the advanced stuff that I wouldn't have gotten to, you know, but it's important where it's talking about, because I, I honestly, I hadn't read that this, that this far and to have seen the part about the machines. Okay, so this is interesting to me, and I think it's relevant because we're, we're talking about, you know, I've given the example of talking about the Schumer resonances, and this is, you know, the flip side of where, you know, Steiner talks about Araman and how, you know, that works. Like, this is the other side of it. The Steiner is a technician, right? He's an astral technician. This is the, the personality side of it, all right? This goes hand in hand, in my opinion, with what Steiner talks about in Araman, all right? Uh, so let me finish reading. The inherent hostility, the inherent hostility of machine-mediated uh, re relatedness is nowhere more obvious than in the instruments of war. All weapons are designed to affect others without affecting ourselves, to make others answerable to the technology of our control. They are used not to maximize the play, but eliminate it. Killers are not victors. They are unopposed competitors, players without a game, living contradictions. The fact that the fact that the technology of slaughter at vast distances has become extremely sophisticated does not culturally advance its highly trained operators over club swinging primitives. It makes complete our blindness to the other that was but rudimentary in the primitive. We are the unseen killing the unseen. The first chapter of the book, um, yeah, the first chapter of the book consisted of three sentences. Here is the final chapter 101 in its entirety. There is but one infinite game. All right, so that's some Cars himself, and that's some profound stuff. So uh, let's read, let's get into the material here. Before we do, right, you see there's no introduction. Right? There's the contents, all right, one. There are, a, right, so I think we need some music. 53 minutes, all right, this is not going to, I told you this is not going to be a short video. And uh, I think I'm going to make something. Let's see if it's on the hot pot or the, uh, the cook and walk. The plug in. Electric.
never. Uh-uh. Never. <laughs> okay. I uh, can't wait to see how that's coming out on the uh, end. You know, your end. Ah, okay. Let's pull the app out of this. All right. Okay. On that cheery note, I have some food burning in the electric uh, skillet. Uh, it's a wok, but it's closer like a skillet. I don't know. Uh, it was 15 bucks at the big top flea market, and I was like, oh, it's worth it. You know, hopefully I don't burn anything down with it. Um, my mom's was a lot nicer. Hers was a West Bend, I think. Um, anyway. So let me um, pause this. Have a, you know, let's all get together about why we're here. Mm, take a breath. Okay. For an hour in, I think we're ready to roll. All right. So um, my guides have sort of suggested to me this kind of uh, illustration of of chess that uh, there's the part of knowing how the pieces move, okay? Like, they're just all the intricacies of how the pieces move. Uh, you know, what they do, you know, just that itself takes a while to, to understand. And then there's developing a strategy or using that information or knowing how to uh, get the pieces to, you know, do what you want them to. So... In a lot of, you know, our our affairs, right, there's this understanding of the rules of the road, the rules of contact, the rules of, of contact, whatever. So I think this is sort of what this is, is that it's an interesting behind the scenes kind of look at game and game theory, game play in a way that, you know, you might not have thought of, uh, but it, I think, gives you an understanding of, like, what's happening now, the end game. You know, you see this all over the place, and that's sort of, you know, like, all right, you know, I say the end of the cycle, they say the end of the game, you know, end game, like, all right, so, uh, you know, it's the clearing of all the accounts. You know, I've talked about this before, and this is the introduction to, you know, what I mean when I say the clearing of the accounts. And a lot of people, the feedback I've been getting to this point is that a lot of people agree with this, right? You know, they know what it means. They agree with this. So uh, I'm going to read through this to a certain point that it's relevant. And uh, um, I think I'm going to limit this at two hours, right? Maybe up to and including the, you know, the next air mix or whatever. Um, all right. So let's read this, all right? Um, there are, and I can't highlight this or whatever, there are at least two kinds of games, right? One could be called, called the finite, the other infinite. The finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. Two, if a finite game is to be won by someone, it must come to a definitive end. It will come to a definitive end. Hold on. There we go. It will come to a definitive end when someone has won. We know that someone has won the game when all the players have agreed who among them is the winner. No other condition than the agreement of the players is absolutely required in determining who has won the game. And this is of the finite game, okay? Um, and this is what I'm talking about of the, you know, the players on the field now needing to, you know, declare that they have, they've lost. If they have indeed lost, and if they haven't lost, they're going to continue fighting. If they don't feel that they've lost, if they don't believe, if they can't see that they've lost, they will continue the play, right? Especially if it's competitive play where they're looking to get the, the goal, their, you know, their reward at the end of the play. Uh... We know that someone has won the game when all the players have agreed who among them is the winner. No other condition than the agreement of the players is absolutely required in determining who has won the game. 
it may appear that the approval of the spectators or the referees is also required in the determination of the winner. However, it is simply the case that if the players do not agree on a winner, the game has not come to a decisive conclusion, and the players have not satisfied the original purpose of playing, even if they are carried from the field and forcibly blocked from further play, they will not consider the game ended. Suppose the players all agree, but the spectators and the referees do not, unless the players can be persuaded that their agreement was not mistaken, they will not resume the play. Indeed, they cannot resume the play. <laughs> We cannot imagine players returning to the field and truly playing if they are not convinced the game is over. There is no finite game unless the players freely choose to play it. One only can play who is forced... Oh, I'm sorry. No one can play who is forced to play. It is an invariable principle of all play, finite and infinite, that whoever plays, plays freely. Whoever must play, cannot play. 3. Just as it is essential for a finite game to have a definitive ending, it must also have a precise beginning. Therefore, we cannot speak of a finite game, speak of finite games, as having temporal boundaries to which, of course, all players must agree. But players must agree to the establishment of spatial and numerical boundaries as well. That is, the game must be played within a marked area and with specified players. Spatial boundaries are evident in every finite conflict from the simplest board and court games to world wars. The opponents in World War II agreed not to bomb Heidelberg and Paris and declared Switzerland outside of the boundaries of conflict when unnecessary and Excessive damage is inflicted by one of the sides in warfare. A question arises as to the legitimacy of the victory that side may claim, even whether it has been a war at all, and not simply gratuitous, unwarranted violence. When Sherman burned his way from Atlanta to the sea, he so ignored the sense of spatial limitations that for many persons, the war was not legitimately won by the Union Army, and, in fact, has never been concluded. Numerical boundaries take many forms, but we, I'm sorry, but are always applied in finite games. Persons are selected for finite play. It is the case that we cannot play if we must play, but it is also the case that we cannot play alone. Thus, in every case, we must find an opponent, or, in most cases, teammates who are willing to join and play with us. Not everyone who wishes to do so may play for or against the New York Yankees. Neither may they be electricians nor agronomists by individual choice, without the approval of their potential colleagues and competitors. <clears throat> Because finite players cannot select themselves for play, there is never a time when they cannot be removed from the game or when the other contestants cannot refuse to play with them. The license never belongs to the licensed, nor the commission to the officer. What is preserved by the consistency of numerical boundaries, of course, is the possibility that all contestants on and off the field of play as they wish, there is such a confusion of participants that none can emerge as a clear victor, who, for example, won the French Revolution. I'm going to read that again. What is preserved by the consistency of numerical boundaries, of course, is the possibility that all contestants can agree on an eventual winner. Whenever persons may walk on or off the field of play as they wish, there is such a confusion of participants that none can emerge, in a, uh, can emerge as a clear victor. Who, for example, won the French Revolution? All right, I get it. I'm sorry. Uh, four. 
To have such boundaries means that the date, place, and membership of each finite game is externally defined. When we say of a particular contest that it began on September 1st, 1939, we are speaking from the perspective of world time, that is, from the perspective of what happened before the beginning of the conflict and what would happen after its conclusion. So, also with place and membership, a game is played in that place with those persons. The world is elaborately marked with boundaries of contest, its people finely classified as to their eligibilities. Oh, and that is so true in, in these historical towns like Providence, you know, Rhode Island and Connecticut and all over, uh, where they had the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and this war, and you have all kinds of monuments to the, you know, war, you know, all this stuff. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, those places. Um, uh, yeah, no, sorry. The world is elaborately marked with boundaries of contest. It's people finally classified into their eligibilities. And some of these areas in the town where, you know, the guy where the general lived, you know, or the admiral, you know, is the nice part of town, you know, like they always give the winning, you know, military guy a really nice part of, you know, the the conquered area, you know. Um, uh, five, only one person or team can win a finite game, but the other contestants may well be ranked at the conclusion of play. Not everyone can be a corporate, corp, uh, corporation president, although some who have competed for that prize may be vice president or district managers. There are many games we enter not expecting to win, but in which we nonetheless compete for the highest possible ranking. Six, in one respect, but one respect only, hold on. <clears throat> only one, an infinite game is identical to a finite game. Of infinite players, we can also say that if they play, they play freely. They must, if they must play, they cannot play. Right. So that's a point, big point that both whoever is playing the game does so willingly. All right. And the only other option is to not play either game, right? You know, but that may be your own game to play because there will always be an interaction between one or, you know, both of those camps. Right? So it's interesting. Unto thine own self be true. All right. Um, okay. So otherwise, infinite and finite play stand in the sharpest possible contrast. Infinite players cannot say when their game began, nor do they care. They do not care for the reason that their game is not bounded by time. Indeed, the only purpose of the game is to prevent it from coming to an end, to keep everyone in play. There are no spatial or numerical boundaries to an infinite game. No world is marked with the barriers of infinite play. And there is no question of eligibility since anyone who wishes may play an infinite game. While finite games are externally defined, infinite games are internally defined. The time of an infinite game is not world time, but time created, created within the play itself. Since each play of an infinite game establishes boundaries, it opens to players a new horizon of time. For this reason, it is impossible to say how long an infinite game has been played, or even can be played, since duration can be measured only externally to that which endures. It is also possible to say in which world an inf it is also impossible impossible to say in which world an infinite game is played, though there can be a number of worlds within a uh, there can be a number of worlds worlds within an infinite game. Finite games are seven, I'm sorry, seven. Finite games can be, can be played with infinite, within an infinite game, but, it, but an infinite game cannot be played within a finite game. Infinite players regard their wins and losses in whatever finite games they play as but moments in continuing play. Eight, if, I like how they have that one 
those two sentences for uh, part seven, right? Uh, eight, if finite games must be externally bounded by time, space, and number, they also must have internal limitations on which the players can do to and with each other. Right? Let me read that again. If finite games must be externally bounded by time, space, and number, they must also have internal limitations on what the players can do to and with each other. All right? So the limits of how you interact with each player. You know, the don't you you you're not allowed to hit the other player below the belt or in the face or you know whatever certain types of activities are out of bounds in that type of play you know certain you know the rules are set right? uh um to agree on internal limitations is to establish rules of play right? okay the rules will be different for each finite game it is in fact by knowing what the rules are that we know what the game is so like in the court the courts <clears throat> for example uh great example you know um or if you look into break into corporate america what the rules are your resume the proper way blah, 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 that way um what the rule what the rules establish is a range of limitations on the players each player must for example start behind the white line or have all debts paid by the end of the month charge patients no more than they can reasonably afford or drive in the right lane to the narrowest sense rules are not laws they are not mandate they do not mandate specific behavior but only restrain the freedom of the players allowing considerable room for choice within these restraints so they establish the rules and say within that you know have fun <laughs> Um, if these restraints are not observed, the outcomes of the game is directly threatened. The rules of a finite game are the contractual terms by which the players can agree who has won. Nine. The rules must be published player prior to play, and the players must agree to them before play begins. A point of great consequence to all finite play follows from this. The agreement of the players to the ap applicable rules, sorry, constitutes the ultimate validation of those rules. Right, let me say that again. The agreement of the players to the applicable rules constitutes the ultimate validation of those rules. All right, so it's by your consent, right? Rules are not valid because the Senate passed them or because heroes once played by them or because God pronounced them through Moses or Muhammad. They are valid only if and when players freely play by them. There are no rules that require us to obey rules. If there were, there would have to be rules for those rules and so on. Right? And it wouldn't matter anyway because you wouldn't follow them anyway. <laughs> uh, 10. If the rules of a finite game are unique to that game, it is evident that the rules may not change in the course of play else a different game is being played. It is on this point that we find the most critical distinction between finite and infinite games. The rules of an infinite game must change in the course of the play. The rules are changed when the players of an infinite game agree that the play is imperiled by a finite outcome. That is, by the victory of some players and the defeat of others. The rules of an infinite game are changed to prevent anyone from winning the game and to bring as many persons as play and uh, as many persons as possible into the play. If the rules of a finite game are the contractual, contractual terms by which the players can agree who has won, the rules of an infinite game are the contractual terms by which the players agree to continue playing. For this reason, the rules of an infinite game have, an, have a different status from those of a finite game. They are like the grammar of a living language, where those of a finite game are like the rules of a debate. If the former in, sorry, in the former case, 
we observe rules as a way of continuing discourse with each other, and the latter, we observe rules as a way of bringing the speech of another person to an end. <clears throat> Interesting point. The rules of grammar of a living language are always evolving to guarantee the meaningfulness of discourse, while the rules of debate must remain consistent. 11. Although the rules of an infinite game may change by agreement at any point in the course of play, it does not follow that any rule will do. It is not in the sense that the game is infinite. The rules are always designed to deal with specific threats to the continuation of play. Infinite players use the rules to regulate the way they will take the boundaries or limits being forced against their play into the game itself. The rule-making capacity of infinite players is often challenged by the impingement of powerful boundaries against their play, such as physical exhaustion, or the loss of material resources, or the hos uh, hostility of non-players, or death. The task is to design rules that will allow the players to continue the game by taking these limits into play, even when death is one of the limits. Right? right? The person died. You can't play anymore. Right? There's a limit. Uh, it, is in, it is in the sense that the game is infinite. This is equivalent to saying that no limitation may be imposed against infinite play. Some limits are taken into play. The play itself cannot be limited. Finite players can... I'm sorry. Finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. Read that again. Finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. Twelve. Although it may be evident enough in theory that whoever plays a finite game plays freely, it is often the case that finite players will be unaware of this absolute freedom and will come to think of I'm sorry, will come to think that whatever they do, they must do. They will, uh, I'm sorry, there are several possible reasons for this. Okay? Uh, we saw that finite players must be selected. While no one is forced to remain a lawyer or a uh, rodeo performer or a kundalini yoga after being selected for those roles, each role is nonetheless surrounded both by ruled restraints and the expectation on the part of others. One senses a compulsion to maintain a certain level of performance because per permission to play in these games can be cancelled. We cannot do whatever we please and remain lawyers or yogis, and yet we could not be either unless we pleased. Right? Uh, since finite games are played to be won, players make every move in the game in order to win it. Whatever is not done in the interest of winning is not part of the game. The constant attentiveness of finite players to the progress of the competition has led them, or can lead them, to believe that every move they make, they must make. It may appear that the prizes for winning are indispensable, that without them life is meaningless, perhaps even impossible. There are, to be sure, games in which the stakes seem to be life and death. In slavery, for example, or political oppression, the refusal to pay, I'm sorry, to play, sorry, the refusal to play the demanded role may be paid for with terrible suffering or death. Even in this event, uh, extreme, this, I'm sorry, even in this last extreme case, we must still concede that <clears throat> Whoever takes up the commanded role does so by choice. Certainly the price for refusing it is high, but that there is a price at all points to the fact that opp oppressors themselves acknowledge that even the weakest of their subjects must agree to be oppressed. 
if the subjects were on resisting puppets or automaton, automatons, ugh, no threat would be necessary and no price would be paid. Thus, the satire of the putative ideal of oppressors and all this, I'm sorry, and Huxley's gammas, Orwell's proles, and Rossum's universal robots, or uh, cop pack. All right, uh, have, not familiar with those. Um, un, unlike infinite play, finite play is limited from without, like infinite play. Those limitations must be chosen by the player since no one is under any, any necessity to play a finite game. Fields of play simply do not impose, impose themselves on us. Therefore, all, all the limitations of finite play are self-limitations. Okay. Uh, 13. To account for the large gap between the actual freedom of finite players to step off the field of play at any time and the experienced necessity to stay at the struggle, we can say that as finite players, we somehow veil this freedom from ourselves. Some self-veiling is present in all finite games. Players must intentionally forget the inherently voluntary nature of their play, else all competitive effort will desert them. From the outset of finite play, each part or position must be taken up with a certain seriousness. Players must see themselves as teacher, as light heavyweight, as mother, etc. In the proper exercise of each roles, we positively believe we are the persons these roles portray. Even more, we make these rules believable to others uh, a lot of, uh, through, through rhetoric and dialogue. It is in the nature of acting. Shaw said that we are not to see this woman as Ophelia, but Ophelia as this woman. All right. Interesting. Uh, if the actress is so skilled that we do see Ophelia as this woman, it follows that we do not see performed emotions and hear recited words, but a person's true feelings and speech. To some extent, the actress does not see herself performing, but feels her pre performed emotion and actually says her uh, memorized lines, and yet the very fact that they are performed means that the words and feelings belong to the role and not to the actress. In fact, it is one of the requirements of her, of her craft that she keep her own person distinct from the role. What, the, what she feels as the person, she is, has nothing to do with Ophelia and must not enter her into playing of the part. Of course, not for a second will, th will this woman in her acting be unaware that she is acting. She never forgets that she has veiled herself sufficiently to play this role, that she has chosen to forget for the moment that she is this woman and not Ophelia. But then, neither do we as the audience forget that we are audience, even though we see this woman as Ophelia and we are never in doubt that she is not. We are in, in complicit complicity with her veil. We allow her performed emotions to affect us, perhaps painfully, or I'm sorry, perhaps powerfully, sorry. Uh, but we never forget that we allow them to do so. So it is with all rules, only, only freely can one step into the role of mother. Persons who answer, I'm sorry, assume, Persons who assume this role, however, must suspend their freedom. Uh, where am I? So, uh, in order to act this role. Mother's words, actions, and feelings belong to the role and not the person, although some person may veil themselves so assiduously that they make their performance believable even to themselves 
overlooking any distinction between a mother's feelings and their own. Uh, the issue here is not whether self failing can be avoided or even should be avoided. Indeed, no finite play is possible without it. The issue is whether we are ever willing to drop the veil and openly acknowledge, if only to ourselves, that we have freely chosen to face the world through a mask. Consider the actress whose skill at making Ophelia appear at, as, I'm sorry, this woman demonstrates the clarity with which she can distinguish the role for herself. It is not possible that when she leaves the stage, she does not give up acting, but simply leaves off one role for another, say the role of actress, an abstracted personage whose public behavior is carefully scripted and pro produced. At which point do we confront the fact that we live one life and perform another, or others attempting to make uh, our momentary forgetting true our momentary forgetting true and lasting forgetting. Oh, I'm not reading that again. You'll have to go read that yourself. <clears throat> what makes this an issue is not the morality of masking ourselves. It is rather that self-veiling is the contradictory act of free... What does it say? Uh. For, oh, yeah, free suspension of our freedom. All right, you suspend, suspend your freedom. All right. uh, I cannot forget that I have forgotten. I may have used the veil so successfully. Oops, sorry, wrong way. I may have used the veil so successfully that I have made my performance believable to myself. I may have convinced myself I am Ophelia, but credibility will never suffice to undo the contradictoriness of self-failing. To believe is to know you believe, and to know you believe is not to believe, etc. Okay. Uh, if no amount of veiling can conceal, uh, if no amount of veiling can conceal the veiling itself, the issue is how far we will go in our seriousness of self-failing, or seriousness at. Ah. So failing. And how far will we will we go to have others act in complicity with us? All right, so this is 14. All right, so I'm at one hour, 33 minutes. All right, so let me pause this. All right, now's a good time to take a break, cigarette break, have a coffee, whatever, because uh, I'm going to myself. <laughs> Hold on. All right, so that, that was a lot of talking. I need, my voice needs a rest. I'm going to play some music, some mix. Uh, you know, I have some food that I've been burning in the background. Uh, so um, I'll let that play. I'll be back in a little bit.
shirts. No, I love this merch. All right, let's get back back to the text. There's only three more parts to this. Uh, like I said, I want to hit the two-hour mark and then be done. All right, so uh, part 14. Um, this is a preview, right? Okay, so and this is enough, plenty enough. Uh, 14, since finite players uh, can be played... Uh, since finite... Uh, 14. Since finite games can be played within an infinite game, infinite players do not uh, es eschew... <laughs> eschew... The performance roles, the performed roles of finite play. On the contrary, they enter into finite games with all of the appropriate energy and self veiling, but they do so without the seriousness of finite players. They embrace the abstract abstractness of finite games as abstract abstractness, uh, and therefore take them up not seriously but playfully right <clears throat> okay this is a tough reading all right the term abstract in parentheses the term abstract is used here according to hegel's familiar definition of it as the substitution of a part of the whole for the whole the whole being concrete all right they freely use masks in their social engagements but not without acknowledging to themselves and others that they are masked. For that reason, they regard each participant in finite play as that person playing and not as a role played by someone, all right? And you know what? We can even include that to the drama with the masks and the, you know, the virus and all that, you know? Uh... Uh, for that reason, they regard each participant in finite play as that person playing and not as a role played by someone. Seriousness it o is always related to roles or abstractions. We are likely to be more serious with police officers when we find them uniformed and performing their mandated roles than when we find them in the process of changing into their uniforms. Seriousness always has to do with an established script, an ordering of affairs completed somewhere outside the range of our influence. We are playing, uh, sorry, we are playful when we engage others at the level of choice, when there is no telling in advance where our relationship with them will come out, when, in fact, n no one has an outcome to be imposed on the relationship apart from the decision to continue it. Okay. To be playful is not to be trivial or frivolous or to act as though nothing of consequence will happen. On the contrary, when we are playing with each other, we relate as free persons and the relationship is open to surprise. Everything that happens is of consequence. It is, in fact, seriousness that closes it itself to consequences for seriousness as a dread of the unpredictable outcome of open possibility. To be serious is to be press for a specified conclusion. To be playful is to allow for possibility, whatever the cost to oneself. There is, however, a familiar form of playfulness often associated with situations protected from consequence where, no matter what we do, within certain limits, nothing will come of it. This is not playing so much as it is playing at, a harmless disregard for social constraints, while this is by no means excluded from infinite play, it is not the same as infinite play. By relating to others as they move out of their own freedom and not out of the abstract requirements of a role, infinite players are concrete persons engaged with concrete persons. <clears throat> For that reason, an infinite game cannot be abstracted, for it is not a part of the whole presenting itself as a whole, but the whole that knows it is the whole. We cannot say a person played this infinite game or that, 
as though the rules are independent of the concrete circumstances of play. It can be said only that these persons played with each other and in such a way that what they be, they began cannot be finished. Okay. Let me read that again. It can be said only that these persons played with each other and in such a way that what they began cannot be finished. All right, 15. <clears throat> Thank God this one's short. In as much as a finite game is intended for conclusion, in as much as its roles are scripted and performed for an audience, we shall re refer to finite play as theatrical. Although script and plot do not seem to be written in advance, we are always able to look back at the path followed to victory and say of the winners that they certainly knew how to act and what to say. Inasmuch as infinite players avoid any outcome whatsoever, keeping the future open, making all scripts useless, we shall refer to infinite play as dramatic. Dramatically, one chooses to be a mother. Theatrically, one takes on the role of mother. 16. One obeys the rules in the finite game in order to play, but playing does not consist only in obeying rules. The rules of a finite game do not constitute a script. A script is composed according to the rules, but it is not identical to the rules. The script is the uh, the script is the uh, the record of the actual exchanges between the players, whether acts or words, and therefore cannot be written down beforehand. In all true finite play, the scripts are composed in the course of the play, <laughs> the making up as they go along. This means that during the game, all finite play is dramatic since the outcome is not yet, I'm sorry, since the outcome is yet unknown. That the outcome is not known is what makes it a true game. The theatricality of finite play has to do with the fact that there is an outcome. Finite play is dramatic, but only provisionally dramatic. As soon as it is concluded, we are able to look back and see how the sequence of moves made, uh, though made freely by the competitors, could have resulted only in this outcome. We see, well, I'm sorry, we can see how every move fit into the sequence that made it inevitable that this person would win. The fact that a finite game is provisionally dramatic means that it is the intention of each player to eliminate its drama by making a preferred end inevitable. It is the desire of all finite players to be master players, to be so perfectly skilled in their play that nothing can surprise them, so perfectly trained that every move in the game is foreseen at the beginning. A true master player sees, I'm sorry, a true master player plays as though the game is already in the past according to a script whose every detail is known prior to the play itself. All right, 17, last one. <clears throat> Surprise is a crucial element in most finite games. If we are not prepared to meet each, to meet each of the possible moves of an opponent, our chances of losing are most certainly increased. It is therefore by surprising our opponent that we are most likely to win. Surprise in finite play is the triumph of the past over the future. The master player who already knows what the moves are to be made has a decisive advantage over the unprepared player who does not yet know what moves will be made. A finite player is trained not only to anticipate every future possibility, but to control the future to prevent it from altering the past. This is not the finite player in the mode. I'm sorry. This is the finite player in the mode of seriousness, with its dread of unpredictable consequences. 
Infinite players, on the other hand, continue their play in the expectation of in the expectation of being surprised. If surprise is no longer possible, all play ceases. Surprise causes finite play to end. It is the reason for infinite play to continue. Right? Surprise causes finite play to end. It is the reason for infinite play to continue. Surprise in infinite game in, I'm sorry, surprise in infinite play is the triumph, triumph, uh, triumph of the future of the past. Since infinite players do not regard the past as having an outcome, they have no way of knowing what has been begun there. <clears throat> With each surprise, the past reveals a new beginning in itself. Inasmuch as the future is always surprising, the past is always changing. Because finite players are trained to prevent the future from altering the past, they must hide their future moves. The unprepared opponent must be kept unprepared. Finite players must appear to be something other than what they... And that's the end that they're letting me go to, right? Other than what they are. All right, so... Um, on that cheery note, let me, um, wow, one hour, 52 minutes. All right, so I'm going to play eight-ish minutes of, of mix.
Yeah, all right. So we're getting ready to land this uh, jumbo wide body here. I'm taxiing on the runway. Um, we got to put this puppy to bed. Um, it's, uh, you know, one thirty in the morning. Uh, it's almost two. This video is two hours long. I, I get, and I get to go get some sleep so I can work on my own. Yeah. You know, um, that's when a lot of my good stuff happens. Uh, and I'm tired enough that I, I'm going to fall asleep. So, uh, I'm going to fade out. Uh, you know, I'll let this play another minute or so and then head off the dash off. Uh, so, thank you all for being here. It's much love. I appreciate everyone you support. Thanks. I'm probably going to do this as a premiere of one of the live live chat um, for you guys. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to make the longer version, the full four hour version of the, um, uh, the original material, the, uh, the, the mission, the full length one of the mission. So, um, that's coming up. Anyway, all right. So, you know, we're going to let's play and I'll see you on the other side. Right. Thank you. Much love. Namaste.